sorry. I had to do that because I thought, well, that'll get everybody's attention. Um, my name is Robin Quinn. I own a company called Big Bang Communications. I'm also the manager of communications and education for Vancouver Island Construction Association. Two different hats, lots of great people to work with. Um, I'm a proud member of CPRS. I'm a former national president and chapter president and I, an avid volunteer. You can't get rid of me, so I just keep coming back. I'm really proud of uh, what we've accomplished today, and I think uh, we are learning a lot and continue to learn. Uh, our next speaker is um, from the technology sector, so uh, a little different kind of perspective here. Uh, Scott Dewis, I, I actually looked up his Twitter bio, because I always say you can tell a lot by someone's Twitter bio. Uh, startup founder, Race Rocks 3D, freshman CEO, defense and aerospace, Emmy award-winning artist, sailor, and parent. So I think that's a work-life balance right there. <laughs> so today, uh, Scott is going to talk to us, I think, as a creator, and that's the direction that we should all be looking at. We're moving as communicators, is that we are curators and creators of the information that we're, we're trying to get out to the audiences that we've selected and targeted. Race Rocks 3D is a visual effects and simulated training studio with strong ties to the Hollywood film industry. I just noticed that they, they announced that Toy Story 4 is coming out, so sweet. <laughs> I don't even have any kids anymore that are young enough to enjoy it, but that's perfect. Uh, Scott and his team celebrate success in defense and aerospace training, gamification, e-learning, and corporate and government uh, communications and marketing. In fact, uh, since January, they've been uh, servicing regional industry and the public sector with communication media that inform, educate, and create a social license. Scott has described their role at Race Rocks 3D as being able to simplify messages and tell the story in a way that people can understand quickly and easily. And they use strong visuals and, hey, once again, human communications and connections. Uh, along with being part of an Emmy award-winning project, Scott's company has been nominated for eight business and technology awards. But according to Scott, the highest honor we've received was when a major aerospace client called us their creative therapist. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Dewis. Thank you. Is this working? So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, honored to be here. Um, you've probably heard from a bunch of really good oral storytellers today. Uh, that's not me. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm with a tech company. Um, I'm a video storyteller. And uh, what that means uh, in my 13 years, ex uh, 13 years doing video storytelling, uh, I prefer to be behind the camera. Uh, behind the internet, behind a computer, is <laughs> sort of where I like to be as far as uh, uh, front and center. So just bear with me. Um, what that also means is that I've brought about 42 minutes worth of videos to watch. <laughs> so, um, so we'll get to those in just a sec. And uh, what I figured I'd do is I'd start with a, um, a little bit about uh, the history, because probably some of you don't know um, my history and Race Rock's history, um, how I got into storytelling or into into VFX and then uh, uh, vid video communications. Um, show you some videos, explain uh, why and how we made the videos, what, what we were thinking, uh, what we were trying to achieve. Um, and then at the end, uh, if we've got time left over, answer some questions. That work? Great. OK, perfect. So um, I've always been an artist. I, you know, painting and drawing from an early age. Um, and in 1993, I uh, graduated from high school and, and, and got accepted to Emily Carr for, uh, for fine arts. Over the summer, I uh, took a look at the, the life of an oil painter uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, salary potential of an oil painter. And uh, um, I had graduated with strong C's in, uh, at, from, from high school. And so uh, in, 2000, in, in 1994, um, I went back to high school and got uh, straight A's in physics and, and math and, and the, the things that you needed to get into university because uh, there was no way I was going to be able to make any money as an artist, uh, so I thought. So I uh, started off in uh, physics and oceanography, 
and uh, found that it wasn't really that creative. So I was losing the creativity for, the, for a job perspective. Um, thought about it and I thought, well, how can I blend math and, and, and science and uh, um, creativity together and, and, and decided to go into mechanical engineering because it was a little bit more, a little bit more creative, a little bit more you know, on the creative side. So I did um, two years um, of, uh, at Camosun College of uh, uh, Mechanical Engineering Technology with university transfer to, um, uh, to UVic. And uh, you know, that was going really well. And in the last year, or in the second year, um, we were introduced to virtual prototyping technology that was actually 3D Studio Max, which was in use by Hollywood uh, to create, at the time, a couple of years earlier, the first Toy Story. Um, and so I started playing with that, and my, my cousin, um, uh, Stuart was actually um, in LA working as an animator, and uh, so we talked back and forth about how to get more out of the program and how to how to you know make the things do what, what I wanted to do. And and um, I got up to the end of the program, and I had a one year wait before I was transferring to UVic to do my mechanical engineering degree. Um, so you know, I, I, I gave I, I was thinking about maybe going to to uh, to take a course on computer animation. So I started talking to my cousin. And um, he said that, uh, you know, I should come down to LA and, and start doing uh, 3D animation. And I said, well, no, I, you know, I'm an engineer. I should be able to start at 60,000 a year, you know, work up to 100,000 in the first five years. You know, I was giving him all the numbers about why I made the choice to go into engineering. And he actually on the phone said, dude, I started at 250 a year. And this is in, in, uh, in 2000. So I went to Vancouver Film School. And, uh, <laughs> and that's sort of uh, where I went from there. So, this is sort of a graph that's going to go with the presentation, uh, creativity versus uh, paying my bills. So that's, that's the thought process that went into that part. So just to recap. So that was, that was the first part. Uh, second part, Act, act 1, uh, 2000 to 2009, it was all games, uh, TV, and film. So I got uh, um, hired right out of film school. Uh, to work at a video game company in 2001, uh, which went under in 2002, um, <laughs> which, which is fine. That's sort of the way that the, the industry worked back back then. Um, but at the same time, I had uh, been talking to my cousin a bit more about getting down to LA, and uh, he had introduced me to to a fellow that would end up being uh, my partner through this 2000 2009 sort of uh, period. Um, he was doing some work for Disney and needed a freelancer, and so I was working at night uh, while I was working at the film studio, or sorry, at the, the game studio. And when the game studio went under, I decided that I was going to go full time as a freelancer. And in 2003, I started Race Rocks Digital, which was a visual effects company uh, based in Victoria, BC, out of my basement. Um, and uh, we we went at it. We started uh, started doing visual effects. Um, First, first TV show that we started on was uh, season two of Alias. Uh, There's a guy, J.J. Abrams, that was uh, sort of up and coming and was doing some, some neat things and was, uh, was really relying on visual effects to, to sort of tell the story of this spy that uh, had all these cool gadgets. And in 2000, a, um, a, a visual effects heavy uh, movie would have 200 shots in it. In uh, 2005, in, or 2004 with Alias, uh, a, visual, a, a primetime TV show had 200 visual effects shots in it, and a, a visual effects heavy movie would have almost every shot would be a visual effects shot, whether it be the color correction or whether it be, um, whether it be uh, you know, creatures or monsters or, or whatever you have to put in it. Uh, set extensions, half the work we did on Alias you don't even see, it was just simply taking uh, Jennifer Garner, who would be filmed on the, um, on the set in uh, Burbank, and we put her in, in Prague or, or Paris or or wherever she needed to be, and you never see that. It's not a, it's not an in-your-face visual effect, but it, uh, it told the story. And uh, so I sort of learned that um, storytelling through visuals is is really important. And um, JJ actually gave us a lot of uh, a lot of room to uh, to help tell that story. So this is kind of a neat uh, a neat thing for the fringe pilot. This is actually a, a cutout of JJ's script, uh, and uh, I'll show you the, the the video clip that it's from before, but. Basically, Nina um, is talking about the cancer in her hand and her arm and how um, it had to be ap amputated. Um, so then JJ always goes, sort of goes into the first person in the, in the, the scripting and, and, and describes what the audience should feel and what she, they should see. And uh, the really important part is the, sort of the last line where it says, 
Uh, its skin is translucent, the mechanics clearly visible. Inside, little gyros turning. It's sort of the most amazing thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, so we actually, uh, we actually got a call from JJ uh, uh, about 12 a.m. They, they shot at night a lot of the time. So we had, got a call from him about 12 a.m. I honestly didn't communicate with him that much. I usually went through the visual effects supervisor. But in this case, um, he wanted to make sure that, that we understood this line. And, and uh, you know, he reiterated on the phone. He said, this thing's got to be the coolest thing you've ever seen. Uh, can you do that? And we said, yeah, we can, we can do that. So uh, from there, that's the sort of direction that we got from him. He sort of let the visual people go to tell the story that he was trying to tell um, uh, through, through words. And uh, so the first, first video I'm going to show um, is just kind of a collection of some of the shots we worked on over, the, over those, uh, those nine or ten years. Uh, we did 113 primetime TV episodes, um, one, uh, one Emmy, uh, nominated for three more. Um, and just, just some neat things to sort of show how these shots wouldn't make a lot of sense without the, uh, the visual storytelling. Uh, and then this is actually... Uh, one of our artists is Lee's reel, and the reason I chose his was because um, uh, he does this shot breakdown where it shows what it looks like without and then with the visual effect, and that kind of gives you an idea of what it, what it looks like. some of the work we did over that time period, um, which, getting back to this, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the list from, uh, from paying the bills to, uh, to being creative uh, came full circle. Um, honestly, wish that, uh, that I'd gone straight to film school in, in uh, uh, 1995 instead of uh, going in 2000, but um, it all, all worked out in the end. So that's sort of phase one. Um, the next phase sort of a shorter phase. Uh, 2009, 2010 was the uh, early onset midlife crisis. A bunch of things happened. The visual effects industry uh, um, started to collapse. It, it sort of went offshoring. Um, if I was, there was a decision that had to be made uh, to leave the basement in Victoria. 
um, and go to Hollywood if I wanted to try and make a career of it. Uh, um, when we started, we were, uh, on Alias, we were um, one of, uh, on, on the first year, we were one of five visual effects companies, but by the end, we were the only one by season five. Lost, we were one of three. Again, it was a bigger show. They wanted to make sure that they were safe. By the end, we were, by season three, we were the only one. Um, because of our quality and because of our price, um, on the season, the, the, uh, the first season of Lost, or the, the pilot of Lost, we underbid our competition by about half a million dollars. On the, on the season premiere of um, Fringe, we were underbid by a major Hollywood studio by $500,000. So just uh, the, the industry was having a bit of a nosedive. There was a lot of talent available. And um, so through that time, um, broke up with my uh, business partner um, over not, not being able to, to keep the company running. Um, uh, started a new business, Race Rocks. Uh, you know, went through some, some financial rock bottoms. Um, there's a good quote that I like <laughs> from uh, J.K. Rowling. So the, the next phase. So act two, so present day. Um, this is where we are right now with the um, Race Rocks. Uh, Race Rocks 3D was started in 2010. Um, it was started at first in parallel with the visual effects company, uh, and then we just, I just, the visual effects work um, uh, basically dried up. And uh, we started, uh, initially we were in, invited into the defense industry to uh, increase the fidelity of simulations. And the, the thing with it is that um, soldiers were looking at their $10 million simulator and it didn't look as good as um, their kid's Xbox. And that, that was a problem for the generals and it was a problem for the, for the trainees. So we said, yeah, you know, we can do that. And it, it seemed like um, there were a few neat things about it. You had to have a security clearance. Um, your employees had to be in Canada in, under, your, under your roof. Um, so as far as building jobs in Canada and, uh, and, and keeping the company in BC and in Canada, it, it was a way ahead. Um, we did a lot of uh, training type stuff, e-learning, uh, simulation support, and um, sort of really built the company up until um, we started offering to a sort of a broader range of things. We, we went, you know, at first they were doing training that, was, uh, that looked like a video game. We started thinking, well, we could take some filmmaking and we could, we could tell a story in, in the training and, uh, and make it more engaging and more interactive for, for the students. So, uh, for instance, there was a, um, uh, a game we did to, to teach uh, Air Force uh, maintainers how to maintain F-18s. And when we originally got the script for it, it the, um, the storyline was uh, you walk into a room and a guy says, there's a broken F-18, go out there and fix it. Um, <laughs> so we said, well, we can make this more engaging. We can make people, we can make people want to take this training. So we, we, um, we suggested, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll show an F-18 getting shot at and taking fire and landing, and then the guys run out and they're like, well, we just don't have the budget for that. So we, um, we then decided, well, what happens if you just show a guy looking over a radio, and the radio, you hear the panic voice of the actor and the panic voice of the pilot saying that he's, that he's taking, taking, uh, uh, taking fire, and, and then, then the sergeant says, get out to the hangar and fix that F-18, we have to get it back on the line. And now the student is engaged in the training, and there's, there's a reason that he's part of the story, and there's a reason for him to be part of this training and to want to go out there and fix that F-18. It's not just go fix it. That's, that's one example of how we started to, to take some of the, uh, the things we learned in Hollywood and apply them um, to what we were doing to just basically stay employed in Canada. Um, so the company has been uh, uh, then started offering to a broader audience. And, um, you know, we were defense uh, defense only for the first year, um, and then we started to think, well, we can offer these guys, uh, you know, marketing and PR and stakeholder engagement. And then we started to br branch out into museums and into government and, uh, and industry and start telling the story of, um, of, of different companies or different, different uh, uh, government groups, uh, including provincial government, uh, federal government, uh, UVic, uh, you know, lots of new clients. We started to grow, and the company's been sort of growing um, Growing year after year, um, cash positive, and uh, and you know making a go of it. So, look at the text. <laughs> um, so that gets into sort of present day. And uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll start. We're going to show a bunch of videos, um, but I'm going to start by by explaining uh, what the um, 
premise was, why we were doing it, and, um, and why we did what we did, and then show the video. So, uh, first one is just our, our own little demo reel. We can show that one without much introduction. See in the mood for uh, for what we're what we do now, present day, and uh, here's another quote that I uh, <laughs> I I have unknown there. I, I have a feeling I have I have a feeling I I've heard it somewhere, but if I have not heard it some somewhere, then then I made it up. Um, but I put unknown there because I, I just have this feeling that I heard it somewhere. Um, and the idea is that uh, um, you know celebrate soon and often because there may not be a big party at the end of the at the end of the jump. <laughs> so the thing with uh, with what we do and I think that what, what all the storytellers here probably do especially in PR is 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 we tell we talk about uh, why and um, when you're trying to sell something there's this idea that um, people don't People will eventually ask the questions who, what, where, when, and how. Uh, they'll eventually want to know those things, but they don't purchase based on who, what, uh, when, or how. They purchase on why. Uh, the example, a, a simple example of that is is Apple. Uh, it just works. You know that's the why of Apple. And then you get in, you you know it has all these features, but they don't sell it. Um, Jobs doesn't stand up and sell it. You know it's got all these cool things. You, you know it's it just works. It it does this. It just it, you know. You're buying why. A good example of that um, that I heard recently, um, one of our mentors at the company um, used to do um, used to do marketing for Thrifties, Thrifty Foods. Anyone from Thrifties? Um, so he told me a story of uh, about why, where I guess Alex Campbell was going buying fruit, and uh, he went to this one um, this this one guy's uh, uh, farm where he was he was selling oranges, and they were the best oranges he'd ever tasted. So he went to the farm and said. I'd like to buy, you know, all your oranges for my store, and um, the guy said, you know, gave him a price, and he said, no, no, that, you know, that's what, what price do you need to keep this farm open next year and the year after and the year, year after? So he gave him a different price, and it was a lot higher. And um, he brought all these oranges back at two or three times what what a regular orange on a, on a uh, what a regular orange on uh, the shelf costs. And his marketing guys all said, you know, this is crazy. How are we going to how are we going to sell this? These things are three times as much as, as the oranges right beside them. And then it dawned on them. They just told people why. They told them the story that uh, Alex Campbell was, was, was there to keep the farmer alive so that he'd have the fruit next year and the year after. And they sold out all the oranges before any of the other ones. So um, the example of how why in marketing and why in sales and why in, uh, in, in, in trying to, to uh, turn people's opinion uh, is very important. People buy why. So we'll get into some videos. Don't don't play this just quite yet. Um, we're going to talk about why for each one of these. So th this video is uh, um, there's a thing in Canada called IRBs, which is Industrial Regional Benefits, and it's a really complex set of uh, ideas about uh, let's say let's say um, Canada wants to buy a plane. Um, every dollar spent on on 
procurement in Canada, a military procurement in Canada, must be spent on a Canadian. Um, now, when, when, when Canada decides to buy a C-130 um, or a, a C-17 from Boeing, um, there's only 10% of the parts in there is made by a Canadian. So there's, um, uh, there's a deficit where Canada has spent too much, or has spent a, big de a great deal of money on this procurement, and it was not on Canadians. So then what, what, what Boeing gets is an IRB offset, or an IRB obligation, where uh, they now have to spend that exact dollar figure on Canadian small industry. It's a great program if it works. It's, it looks like it's, it, it's, it's getting, there's, there's more regulations coming to actually make it work. Um, the company that we did this, this sort of marketing video for, um, first off, we like to do videos under one and a half minutes. <laughs> Um, because we do a lot of online type things and, and anything over that, people just don't, don't pay too much attention. Um, so the, the company that we did this for connects small industry with large defense procurements. And um, the idea was that they, you know, all these little places in Canada are building components for these large military procurements. And so this is the video that we came up with um, uh, based on, on those, uh, on, on what the company did. on their website and then the Industry Canada and WD and, uh, and the federal government saw it and now they, they play that video at shows where they're trying to talk about our IRBs. So um, it gave them sort of an idea that you know, all these parts are coming together and, 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 and forming equipment. Um, that's, that's the OMX video. Um, so UVic, UVic was a, was a special case. Uh, anyone from UVic here? UVic? So, um, Ocean Networks Canada came to us uh, at the beginning of, or the end of last year, and uh, a lot of their, their uh, funding had been cut. And uh, so what they wanted to do was create some videos uh, for stakeholder engagement that they could play uh, going into a conference, or uh, going into a, a, a meeting. They could play the video, uh, give a presentation, and, and hopefully ask for some, uh, ask for some help. Um, in this case, it was from WD. So we, we created, um, Four videos around, um, four four videos around uh, trying to raise funds for uh, for ONC. Um, one of them was around uh, earthquake and oh, I'll back up a bit. Um, ONC does a lot of really cool things. They they do they monitor ocean salinity. They 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 monitor whale noise. They can they monitor vessel traffic. They uh, <laughs> um, they do really cool research. They do commercialization. Like it's a really cool. Um, uh, really, really cool organization. But when they sat down with us, they wanted social license. And we said, okay, what, what do you guys do that affects the most people? And they said, well, we can, you know, we can um, give you a tsunami, tsunami warning and we can give you a 30 second earthquake warning. And we thought, okay, well in BC that, that, would, that would relate to the most amount of people. So we, uh, we built one uh, video around uh, tsunami and earthquake warning, which wasn't really their core, core competency. That wasn't, that wasn't, you know, their, their their key focus, and we built another one around um, around vessel traffic safety because with the oil and all the different things that are going on, um, that was another focus of the government, focus of the people of BC. Um, maybe not a core focus of ONC, but you know, if if you're looking for money um, and you have that ability, then then uh, uh, 
you know, give it a, give, give it a try. So I don't have the vessel traffic one. Uh, the first video up there is the tsunami warning video. Some of the, uh, just one sec, um, we were also trying to uh, use the pain solution, um, the, the pain solution format where you, you identify a pain and then you give the solution, um, sort of like a business plan. The, uh, <laughs> that, that so, sort, sort of, uh, um, so in the pain we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to give an emotion and to affect people as quick as possible because we only had about a minute. And uh, so what we did was we found images that were iconic. There's certain images uh, in certain things that you can remember where you were when you saw them. Um, so the, the Challenger, um, the J Japanese tsunami. And so we added some of those images just to play on the, the tear strings and, and to get people engaged. Um, this was shown to government. Um, they, small part, mostly because of the cool stuff ONC does, small part, but what we do, or a small part, hopefully, to the videos, they received uh, 18 million for tsunami research and 20 million for vessel traffic research. So, there's that one. It's a very small part from us, not to... <laughs>
two years ago, I guess, and the Boeing executives were saying that um, air traffic is going to double in the next 15 years. It's going to go from uh, from 4.5 billion people a year to um, 15, or sorry, from 4.5 to 9 billion uh, travelers per year, and that's going to be buoyed by uh, middle class in China, middle class in India, and a middle class in South America. Um, that's going to require that Boeing, first off, replace 20,000 legacy aircraft and then build 20,000 new aircraft, uh, $5 trillion worth of sales. I thought, we have to be part of that. <laughs> That's the, there's, 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 you know, there's no, no other company on earth that can say something like that, or not, not many companies on earth that can say something like that. Um, there's not many countries that can say something like that. So, so we were working with them. We had broken in. We were, we were doing some, some work for them uh, around um, sales and customer engagement. And uh, these we built as a proof of concept to, um, uh, on, our, on our own dime, not, not, not Boeing's, uh, to show what uh, social media and guerrilla marketing could do, uh, guerrilla PR for, could do for them. Um, the three concepts, we'll, we'll play through them, but um, the one that's really important to Canada is, is the F-35 uh, versus F-18. Um, Canada sole sourced the F-35 from Lockheed Martin, a uh, big political problem. Um, cost overruns, all sorts of different things. This video so has a little bit of controversy in it, and because of that, um, uh, it over American Thanksgiving over American Thanksgiving long weekend, we we launched it to our own social network. So, I think our company has about through everyone in our company, we have about five thousand friends of LinkedIn or or Twitter or, or whatever. We launched it and forgot it. Um, uh, on uh, the, the we figured that. With American Thanksgiving, it would take a while for Lockheed to, to give a response. Um, so over those three days, it got 100,000 hits in, um, in Ottawa and Washington and Chicago. Uh, it was featured in uh, uh, Wall Street Journal, Time, uh, Newsweek, Aviation Weekly. Um, it was featured ba basically for a $6,000-ish uh, video. Uh, they got multiple millions of dollars worth of exposure. Uh, so we can play the first one. And it's it's way outside of the box of what they would how they would do their social license or the marketing. Hey Billy, what did you buy with the ten dollars Grandpa gave you? This beauty, the new F thirty five Strike Fighter with the super helmet and electronic computer, and it's invisible, but it's right there. What did you buy with Grandpa's ten dollars? Three Boeing F eighteen Super Hornets with all the latest avionics and 10 years of full Boeing service support. Yeah, but your planes aren't invisible. Okay, want to have a battle for the sky? No, it broke. Canada has since gone to recompete on the F-35. Not that we did that, but... Uh, um, not, not that we're responsible for that, but uh, if, if they choose the F-18, then I, I think we should get a bonus. But uh, these, are, um, these are continuations uh, of the same two kids, but less, less, uh, less politically uh, charged. They didn't do as well. I think there were like 10,000 views. So a little bit of controversy helps online. Hey, Billy, how come your new plane isn't flying? It broke. You have serial synchro phaser failures on engines two and four. Yeah, my propeller fell off. Who's doing your flight maintenance and logistics? I you know, the usual guys. Whoa, that's rough. This is the C-17 Glowmaster III with the Boeing Maintenance and Service Program. It covers maintenance, engineering, logistics, and operations. It oversees operational readiness 99%. Whoa, that's Cool. Here, my guys have a spare. You can borrow it, but you should really get with the program. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, and there's one more of those. It's, it's a little bit more Monty Python-ish. Um, the, the, the director that we used, the, these two kids are from Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and then the director um, directed um, he directed uh, Escape from Planet Earth, I think it was. So uh, he was actually in the, the Making Waves video, the first guy that talked. Um, and, uh, you know, really, really great guy and a little bit, a little bit, uh, um, little bit of a sense of humor. So this is the last one. It's, it's, 
Yeah. On the videos? Um, you might be able to see this. Did you see the size of that? It's hard to identify that. Five meters in closing. That's one mean looking chicken. Just as well, we signed up for the boy support system. Initiating immediate aircraft readiness. We gotta go, go, go. Um, so it turns, yeah, nobody was hurt in the making of that. Um, so so it, tur it turns out that uh, we got some really positive feedback um, uh, about how well the video is performed by Boeing, but we also were told that it's just too far outside the box for their marketing campaigns. Um, uh, but, you know, give it a few years and we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll try again. So we're, we're doing more, more, um, um, more technical stuff for them now. Um, how are we for time? I know we started a little late. Doing good? 15? Oh, great. Okay, yeah. I was going to speed it up. All right. Um, the next one is, is a bit off, uh, a bit different. Um, it's more about, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's more about PR, um, telling the story of, of, of Biotech. Um, Biotech is, uh, it, it's uh, Victoria's Tech uh, Tech Association, the Victoria Victoria Advanced Technology Council. Um, the Viatech is Victoria's largest private, or but the group of Viatech companies are, are Victoria, or the tech sector, is is uh, Victoria's largest uh, uh, industry by by dollar figure. Uh, they passed tourism three or four years ago. Um, so Viatech makes up uh, eight hundred, or the tech community in Victoria makes up eight hundred uh, member or eight hundred companies that do. Uh, Three billion in revenues a year and employ fifteen thousand people. So it's a it's a major sector, and um, one of the things that was happening is that people were thinking Victoria is just tourism. It's tea and flowers, and so even uh, at one point, uh, uh, Chris Hatfield um, tweeted that you know there's Victoria, it's all about tea and flowers, and so the tech community kind of got riled up, and we we talked to Viatech and. Um, we did one video that was sort of a, a message to, to Chris Hatfield, and that, that went really well. It got about 10,000 10, hits, uh, showing the tech community sort of rile up and, and, and etch uh, and etch the space shuttle, the side of the or the side of the space station. It said, uh, 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 "Not just tea and flowers, Tectoria." Um, I don't have that one to show. It's online somewhere. If you just if you just uh, Google uh, Viatech and Chris Hatfield, um, this uh, these are actually. So this is a continuation of it. They're introducing their new their new statue, this this Freddy the robot, and um, this is what the actual statues look like. And so we thought it'd be funny um, to at, at the award show to to play these little vignettes uh, before each award. So there's not a lot of there's not a lot of storytelling. There's there's a little bit of like gag storytelling. We had an animator from from uh, ILM uh, do the animation and. Uh, there's a little bit of sort of slapstick storytelling, but it's 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 more just uh, introducing Robbie uh, doing all these touristy things in in Victoria, um, because tech is uh, larger than than tourism. So that was that was the thinking behind it anyway. But it's kind of cute. Um, the other thing from a PR standpoint, at the end of each of these, um, there's a postcard created, and uh, there was a thousand of those post postcards um, actually created. And uh, given out to all the all the people at the Tech Awards, so um, it sort of ties in with uh, with a lead behind at the Tech Awards. This, this we did for free.
sense, but it may not make a lot of sense, but he's sort of the, one of the leaders in the tech community. That's, that's, that's why he's in there. He's the uh, director of Kixai in town. So Viatech is sort of a part of the community, so we try to get lots of different community spots or, or segments. Sort of. <laughs> that, that's actually Tech Tory, and this is Dan Gunn's uh, office, so that's why that one's in there. Makes more sense to Tech, tech community. Uh, now, this one's a little bit different from the other ones that you've been looking at. This is uh, telling a story in training that I was talking about. This is kind of a, this is actually interactive, but, I'm, but we've actually recorded it so that you can see it. Um, this, this is uh, some training that, it, that now exists on, on Exxon Hibernia. Um, the, the, um, uh, the oil rig, I guess, has, um, has lifeboats that uh, once a year or once every few months, the guys have to go and learn how to, how to launch them and how to maintain them. Um, that training was done before by flying them ashore. Uh, the training now lives in a kiosk. Um, kiosk on the rig where the, the, um, the, the oilmen can uh, sit down and take two or three hours of e-learning, uh, play a couple of games, and then do some simulation. Um, this is just one example of the training that, 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 that's part of it. Um, the demographic of the coxswains on this rig are 40-year-old Newfoundlanders, and so one of the things that we like to do is try and get uh, humor, cultural re relevance into, uh, into our training. Um, people remember something entertaining. If, you're, if, you're, if you can remember a good, good instructor in school, then he, was probably pr or he or she was probably very entertaining. Uh, so we try and do that with our, with our computer-based training that, that we do. Um, these guys are uh, Buddy What's His Name and the Other Fellows, which is a like a very famous uh, comedy troupe from the East Coast, and uh, we got them, and they, they they actually did all the all the dialogue for the training. We just let that go. So telling a story for training. Cocky or coxswain here. Hi, Buddy's the name. Engines is my game. In an emergency, there's no time to waste. Everything needs to happen smoothly, quickly. It's got to be right the first time, because your co-workers depend on you. Okay, today we're going to learn about lifeboat engines. Remember, your lifeboat ain't going anywhere unless the engine is working properly. Could mean some sort of disaster for you and your crew when you hit the water. So, pay attention. Yes, folks, Buddy loves engines. Did you see the 454 he put in the army? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no time for that, Ray. This is no yammy, my friend. First, you're going to learn how to check the engine over to make sure that it will start before we go to launch. Part of the check is actually to start it up and let it warm up. We finish by shutting down the engine. Rest assured she'll work when we go to lunch. We go to lunch? Lunch. We're going to have to work before we go to lunch, eh, boy? Lunch, 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 lunch. lunch. Check that the right amount of oil is on the dipstick. If it's too low, go get some. Where would they keep the oil? <laughs> Quite worse. They're sucking a thousand gallons a minute out of the ground. Should be easy to find a drop, hey, boy? Check that the gear oil is full and clear. What if it's not? Well, you don't have time for an overall, so frigate, top her up. Check that the coolant in the header tank is at the right level. The head in the cooler tank? No, the coolant in the header tank. Oh, uh, not the same. No, not the same, Ray boy. And finally, check over here on the fuel tank gauge to make sure that it's full. Hope we stop at the gas station on the way. Blessed Lord Suffer. You're the pure, Ray. Check that the valves are open and that the exhausted drain is closed. What did he say, Wayne? He said, haw your dryers up after you pee. Turn the battery switch to the first position. That would be position number one, I believe. Unless you're into quantum mechanics, Ray, in which case... Well, stop, buddy, stop, stop, stop. Back to the battery switch. 
Finally, disengage the gear and increase the throttle in reverse to max. This will help get first. Turn the ignition key to the on position. Check the indicator lights. They should all be on except for the glow plug one. Here at the top. Lick that race here as hot. You'll Lick. be licking the tops of my knuckles in a minute. Then turn the key to the heating position and the glow plug light should, well, well, it should light up. Keep the key in the heating position for 10 seconds. Then press the key in and turn it. When the engine's fired and humming away, pull the throttle back to ray mode. Ray mode, buddy? What do you mean? Idle. Okay, check the gears are working and engaging properly by moving the shifter in and out of forward and reverse gear. No point in setting down in the sea when you can't move. Best to find out now before the other lifeboats fill up. No need to leave that thing running. We're just testing it. To stop the engine, press and hold this big red button. It's hard to miss. This is the fuel shut off. This one, buddy. As long as it doesn't say fire a missile ray, you're okay. Turn the key off, and finally, turn the battery off. Okay, now it's your turn. Remember, myself and the other fellows won't be here. You're the man. Others will be counting on you. You had to do it in the right order, as smoothly and as quickly as possible. No pressure or anything. You can use the checklist if you get lost, but that'll slow you down. So then they run through it themselves, and, and they're trying to beat Buddy's time. Um, they uh, get a score, a comical score from, like... Um, landlubber to master um, that gets uh, put up in the mess and so they, they, they get to see how everyone else is doing and there's, there's the competitive aspect, there's competitive aspect, there's the, uh, the social aspect of it. Um, so that's sort of how we use story in, in gamified training. Uh, kind of a good example of it, um, just a small, small snippet of it. Um, the last one is a marketing video we did for um, Inuktin Robotics, again a really um, a cool uh, local or Nanaimo-based company uh, that that does uh, uh, ro robots that uh, um, that are used at say like the um, uh, the nuclear uh, plants meltdowns in Japan. They were at Ground Zero uh, for 9/11. Um, they do sort of search and rescue and and uh, uh, they do a lot of things hidden in environments that people can't go. And so uh, this guy is actually the creator of the first robot and the founder of the company. And uh, so we wanted to, A, uh, tell a little bit of a story about him, and then showcase these really cool things that do, do things in places where nobody can see them. Uh, so we went with sort of a higher end visual effect type, uh, um, uh, type video. And we'll let that one go. Hopefully. Oh, we got two. Uh, there's two videos up, I think. It might, it might just go slow. Oh, either. They're both the same. It's, it's just, uh, I think it was just open twice. Introducing the art and science of Inuktum technology. Clear vision in confined spaces. Designed to be modular and maneuverable. Adapting to any situation, surface, or environment. From climbing walls, to inverted inspection. Reach the unreachable. See the unseen. Modular in design. Infinite in application. 
See it for yourself. Cool, so those are some examples of uh, the type of uh, visual storytelling that we do, um, from training to um, uh, PR, stakeholder engagement, social license, uh, most of it for industry or aerospace or, or government. Um, and we've got a lot of big new things uh, that will be coming out over the next three months or so. Um, so I guess the next thing is to open it up for questions, if, there, if we have time. Uh, it really depends on the. Uh, it really depends on, you know, what medium is being used. If it's if it's visual effects like in Uckton, uh if it's just um, clip art, in most cases, uh, the, you know, some of them are just sort of footage that the company has, and we we put together into into an edit. Um, so it really depends. We are not we're not low end. We're not like get your get your um, uh, commercial done at at uh, you know one of the local TV studios for fifteen hundred dollars. Um, we're not that. We're sort of starting. I guess projects range from uh, about twelve thousand to about four hundred thousand. So we're sort of we're sort of higher end for most like smaller corporate stuff. It's going to be between twelve and thirty. Um, for the government stuff, it can be a little bit more. Um, <laughs> any other well, questions? Well, to keep quiet. <laughs> to keep quiet. I'm not good at keeping quiet. Uh, it's small groups of alcohol. Small groups of alcohol. <laughs> yes? Um, the question is, is it custom or not training them to get interactive web? Oh, it's interactive. It's on the web. It's, it's in a, yeah, it's actually, it, this, it, it can live on the web. It's part of an LMS. It's, it's e-learning, basically, gamified e-learning. Um, this one lives uh, in a Moodle environment on a kiosk um, on, uh, on Hibernia. So they sit down and, and use it there. Um, the 3D titling that was used in um, Fringe, oh, yeah. it was also in Flash Forward, I think, as well. Wasn't Flash it? Forward, yeah. yeah. Flash Forward. Yeah. I remember when it came out thinking, oh my god, that is so cool. And then you got really tired of it. <laughs> no, but yeah, 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 it did get yeah. big and hot. But how do you, I mean, how do you communicate, did you guys come up with that, first of all? Uh, well, it, again, it was a, a line, a line from one of JJ's uh, scripts that just said, you know, the, the text is part of the environment; it's floating in the air. And oh, so I then we we showed him some examples. And I would think that when you come up with something that's stylized like that, the job then would be trying to communicate what is possible to the client. How, how does that yeah. work? Did you uh, in that specific? It sounds like JJ was the one that came up with the idea, and then you guys made well, it happen. Yeah, he he came up. That way, or is it well, in, for that, it's, it's, it's mostly just trying to make the script happen, right? If, if, he, if he says something crazy, in, or if, if the writer or the, the director says something crazy in the script, um, then you just have to make it happen. It could be, you know, you walk into a magical forest that's red, and, you know, and then it becomes a much bigger deal um, than floating letters, which is, which is a little bit less, uh, less of a big deal. But we, we had a lot, of, um, a lot of license to do know, to, to show them things and, and, and get approvals and to make them better, um, you know, than, than what um, what the original description is. We had a lot of license to try and make it better. And, and when you're working on a show that, you know, all your family watches and everything, you try and you try and give it a little bit, a little bit extra to make it, uh, to make it really good. Uh, yep. Um, it's a, it's a, yeah, so we, right now we're about 15 people on staff. Um, we have been to 25 uh, before defense, before the federal government stopped spending on, uh, on defense. Um, but uh, we're growing again. We're, we're, we're going back up. As far as outsourcing, uh, or as far as uh, subcontracting, um, we do it on an as and when basis. Like uh, we had some shoots in, in the interior. We, we hired locals to do the shoots and just sent a, sent a producer. Um, same with Vancouver. Um, even even in town, we'll hire we'll hire local camera people or local uh, um, local film professionals and and just send a producer to to um, um, to supervise or to, to get the shots that they need. So, in the interest of keeping us 
Thank you.